Welcome to the Bark Show, everybody. My name is Pam, and today I'm joined by my lovely co-host, Susanna. This show is brought to you by Toronto Dog Walking and I Speak Dog. So guys, we have a really, really fun, fun show in store for you today. CBD oil for dogs. We've all heard it out there. It's on Facebook, it's on Instagram, it's all across the media. So we have Mark from Canna Canine joining us today to tell us lots more about CBD oil go through some case studies, tell us more information about how it can help our dogs. Susanna's gonna go through some more research that we have from Penn State University that links vet, or sorry, <coughs> that links pet behavior to their owners. What you need to do if you lose a dog, when if, if the unnecessary and the God forbidden happens that you lose your dog, what do we need to do next? And the biggest and most important part of today's show is how to choose a good dog trainer. There's so much misinformation out there and there's lots and lots of it. So we're going to go through a segment on that. And then at the end, Susanna is going to answer your dog training questions live on air. So if you have a question for Susanna, you can go ahead and pop it in the comment section now and we will get to it at the end of the show. So at any point throughout the show, you can just pop it in the comment section and we will come to it during that segment. So even if you're not going to be staying with us for the duration of the show, you can come, go ahead and come back and look in at later on. So guys, if you are watching, go ahead and say hello. Let us know that you're watching and join in the conversation as we go along. We love to hear what you have to say. Like who doesn't love to talk about dogs? So we want to hear everything that you have, have to say. So moving on to our first segment. So, have you guys actually heard of CBD oil in dogs? Like it is relatively new and I know so many of you want to know more about CBD oil, including myself and Susanna definitely has a lot of questions that she wants to know. So today we were joined by Mark from Canna Canine to help us find out more about CBD oil, help educate the rest of us. So if you have any questions as well for Mark, and if you're watching the replay, go ahead and pop them in the comment section and Mark will be able to come back in and answer them later on during the day. So welcome to the show, Mark. I'm just waiting for it to come in now. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me today. Hi, Mark. So excited to have you today. Like with the CBD oil for dogs, like there's so much information out there that people just aren't aware what it is, what it can do. They might have negative associations with CBD oil. So can you just tell us in your own words what, what CBD oil is? Yeah, so CBD is um, pretty popular at the moment and everything. And um, CBD itself is, um, you know, you can find it even in beauty products. Um, it's That's how the way that the industry is going and everything. But CBD is one of 113 compounds that are uniquely found in the cannabis plant. Now, unlike um, THC, CBD can't make you high. Now, CBD from hemp, the hemp plant naturally has a higher percentage of CBD, and that's where um, you see a lot of CBD on the market coming from as well. Um, specifically with Canna Canine, we use CO2 extracted organic um, CBD from hemp, and you know, that goes into all of our products. Now, how does CBD work? CBD is uh, it's pretty amazing. So all mammals have something called um, the endocannabinoid system, and the endo endocannabinoid system is a series of... Um, receptors and um, activators within our neurological system. And what CBD does is that CBD helps to regulate these um, processes and then CBD binds with these receptors and it basically tells the body to help things with like stress, sleep, pain management and all that good stuff as well. So CBD is naturally occurring and um, CBD is the only natural known substance that actually activates the endocannabinoid system. So CBD has benefits for dogs, for humans, for cats, horses. Um, there's a wide, wide range of uh, benefits for CBD. And um, it's amazing now you're even finding CBD in not only the dog, well, the pet industry, but it's also um, in the beauty industry as well. There's things like CBD bath bombs as well, where you drop it in water and it has some great um, therapeutic uh, effects, any inflammation as well, CBD creams and CBD um, bombs as well. Now, what does CBD look like? This is CBD right here. This is CO2 extracted. So it's thick like a molasses. Now with the CBD oil, um, we mix it with a carrier oil with an MCT coconut oil. And then it basically, it turns into this. This is the Canna Canine CBD oil, the hemp oil that um, for so many benefits about 
um, and everything as well. Um, what does CBD help with? CBD helps with an amazing range of benefits for dogs. Um, everything from anxiety, allergies, cancer, pain, um, seizures, um, lots and lots of research is now coming out um, to support CBD as well because a lot of the evidence is um, anecdotal still. A lot of owners um, report the benefits of it, but now actually veterinarians are coming more on board with it and seeing the benefits of it as well. There's a great association by the name of the Canadian Association of Veterinarians for Cannabinoid Medicine, the CAVCM, and um, they're veterinarians that actually see the benefits of CBD, but with the current legalization right now is that they can't prescribe it because it's not their part of the scope of practice. But uh, when the laws do change in Canada, CBD will be able, um, people will actually be able to take CBD openly without a prescription or anything like that. And it'll be more regulated in a sense as well. So you'll be seeing CBD beauty products, CBD pet treats as well. And um, especially in the U S there's great stories of how it's helped, um, you know, dogs and everything as well. Um, a couple of studies that I always uh, reference is um, out of Colorado state state university. There's a neurologist by the name of uh, Dr. Stephanie McGrath, and she just completed two clinical trials using CBD for dogs with um, arthritis and CBD for dogs with seizures. And, um, you know, people know that it works, especially a lot of my clients as well. Um, you know, CBD helps get rid of seizures. Um, you know, dogs will take something um, known as phenobarbital, which can have horrible side effects on the dog. It makes them you know, very lethargic, very dopey, you know, lack of energy and everything. But by giving CBD to the dogs, it's actually helped to reduce and eliminate the number of seizures as well. That's so interesting. Um, with the dogs who have arthritis, how does it actually help? The, is it helping their joints? What kind of movement and motion that is the CBD oil actually help them with them? Yeah, so CBD is great uh, just in terms of that. Um, it does help with inflammation and it does help with the, uh, the pain management as well. Um, I had, uh, a well, I have a client of mine. Her dog, um, Sebastian, had a horrible accident when he was younger and um, basically, you know, wasn't able to walk, but through um, therapy and everything as well, um, CBD actually helps him have a better quality of life now. So he's not as stiff um, in the morning when he gets up and everything as well. And it's fantastic for arthritis. You know, there's people um, that use it on their dogs. You know, they notice a difference um, sometimes a little bit sooner. Sometimes, you know, it might take up to a week of continued use and everything. But, you know, just like us humans, you know, we wake up in the morning sometimes a little bit stiff. We might take an aspirin or something else to help us with that. And that's how CBD is a natural way to help the pet, um, you know, move along and everything as well. So it's not, you know, it doesn't have that pain that it, want, that it would if it um, wasn't using CBD in that regard. That's so good. And that's what like the, the way you're talking there about seizures. My mom has um, a dog. She's a little shih tzu, but she has epilepsy since she was born. So she's constantly always having seizures and they go through so many different medications trying to just figure out what the right mix would be. So if she was to look at something like CBD oil, would it help with like epileptic fits and seizures that she would have? Yeah, definitely. CBD does help with uh, seizures and epilepsy as well. You know, I've heard countless stories of where dogs have, you know, have taken so much medication and everything like that. Um, one case study is uh, Blaze. Blaze was on phenobarbital. And um, I've never heard of phenobarbital before, uh, you know, in this before this instance and everything as well. But uh, Blaze's mom was telling me of how Blaze was, you know, falling down the stairs and everything after taking phenobarbital. Eventually, she started to wean Blaze off of phenobarbital and started to give him CBD oil. And now he's completely seizure free. And that was just from the CBD oil as well. Um, so CBD has a lot of amazing benefits as well. But one of the things that I do recommend to owners is definitely do your research with CBD because there are known certain drug interactions with prescribed medication with CBD. And um, I have that under my website actually under why CBD. There's a whole section dedicated to potential drug interactions. Um, just like, you know, you wouldn't take, you wouldn't drink a glass of wine when you have back rela relaxation medicine, you know, so there's kind of sense involved with that as well and everything. It might feel good, but it's not something that I recommend that you do <laughs> as well. Um, so just always be aware of that and tell your vet that um, you're taking CBD, um, you know, you're looking into CBD for your, for your dog. If your vet isn't, um, you know, on board with it or isn't um, in support of it, honestly, you can just Google and, um, you know, fantastic resources on, you know, certain conditions as well. 
um, I'm always available to take, you know, questions and comments, um, you know, and help the best that I can as well and everything. But I always recommend, you know, consult with your vet first. Tell them that you are taking, that your dog will be taking CBD and um, just be careful of it as well and everything because you have to be careful with THC. Um, THC can induce um, very, very bad ap episodes within dogs, um, you know, inducing things called static ataxia where it basically, you know, knocks the dog out. It makes them droop, it makes them lazy. Um, you know, so the experience, the fun high that you experience from THC, whether, you know, with an edible and everything, your dog's not going to, um, you know, experience the same joy as you are and everything mm -hmm. once it gets mm -hmm. your smash. So that's a lot of the horror stories that you're hearing in the media right now is that when dogs get into, you know, their, their owner's edibles, you know, their marijuana stashes, that's when they get sick because it's all the THC. Um, you know, I have a 10 pound Jack Russell at home and I've given her copious amounts of CBD to help with her um you know a range of problems everything from anxiety or pain and um even her seizures as well um you know so cbd can never really you know harm the dog on its own um you know the most that will happen is that even if i give gave my dog too much cbd she'll just go to sleep naturally because that's what dogs do you know when they're calm and happy and everything as well um you know they're not going to get high from it it's virtually impossible to get high from t from cbd because there's no THC in it CBD, unlike THC, is not psychoactive, and especially CBD from hemp. Now, that's to distinguish um, to distinguish from marijuana. Marijuana does have um, CBD in it, but hemp naturally has a higher percentage of CBD in it. And the hemp plant, legally, um, industrial hemp is classified as anything anything less than three percent THC in it. So, you can't get high from um, consuming hemp. I mean, no one's ever smoked a hemp joint before. And <laughs> high, if you have, then you know it's something else. But, uh, but yeah, that's the key distinguishing between um, you know CBD and um, CBD from hemp and CBD from marijuana in that regard. So always make sure that um, you know you know where you're getting your supply from with CBD as well. All of our products are lab tested, so I know what's actually. How much CBD is present in it? How much THC, if anything, if any, is present? Testing in it as well, just to make sure that you know the sources are there and the sources are clean and pure as well. I know our suppliers; I have a relationship with them, so I know where it's coming from. And uh, in that regard, I'm more trustworthy to give it to my pets as well. Yeah, like so that's, that's so, imagine, uh, sorry, Susanna. I can imagine the best. Sorry, I, I look. I can't, you're, I'm losing you a little bit. Sorry. Um, I have. I have a really quick question for you. Yeah. Um, honestly, I use CBD oil for my back, so I can vouch for the benefits yeah. of CBD oil too, for sure. Um, so you mentioned that your products are organic, which is really important to me yeah. because like, I do have some clients that have anxiety and they are definitely looking into organic uh, products. Uh, what are some of the side effects of CBD oil, if there's any, or can a dog overdose on CBD oil? So there's are certain there's some studies that say that um, you know with too much CBD and everything as well they can um, cause like dry mouth and everything. The dog may be a little bit lethargic. They may be a little slow in that regard and stuff. But CBD on its own doesn't really have any reported side effects. I mean, even if you take too much of it, um, you'll just be relaxed and everything as well. And um, so uh, for dosing, it's basically based on weight system but then it's also based on how much does the dog need um you know i know that our for our products our dosing tier is a little bit higher just because that we found before we launched the company that's what works with our um, customers and everything as well but you know then again it is a recommended dosage so and it's a guy it's not a guideline in that regard so you start low and then work your way up i mean you know a dog that has high anxiety may need a little bit more but um, you know, than a little than a dog who's a little bit smaller and needs it for pain management and everything as well. It's almost a dog by dog basis. It's like you know, with humans when you prescribe medication and everything, mm -hmm. so people are more susceptible to certain drugs rather than others and everything. You know, some people it takes one glass of wine to get them drunk. You know, others it takes you know lots and lots and everything as well. So it really depends on the dog and what you're treating it for as well. But um, I definitely recommend to you know, start low and then work your way up and then kind of experiment with the dosage as well. Um, you know, I have um, some customers with 150 pound dogs um, and, you know, based on their, based on our um, dosing recommendations, it's, you know, three full droppers full of CBD for the 500 milligrams. And then eventually they work their way down to two because they kind of, they see, okay, this is the optimal amount of CBD that the dog needs in that regard. 
Um, and fantastic, you mentioned that you are taking CBD oil for your back as well. Yes. Um, the CBD oil that, um, you know, Can of Canine has, there's nothing dog about it, to be honest with you. It's just the marketing behind it. You know, I'm a dog lover, obviously, but we have people that purchase it for themselves. Um, you know, they give it to their dog. Also, I've had people who purchased it for their horses and mm -hmm. uh, for their cats as well. And I've seen all the great benefits of it. You know what? I'm so happy that we have you on the show today because, like, my dog suffers from uh, skin allergies. We yeah. can't figure out what it is. And, like, right now he's getting extremely bloody skin. And uh, I, I know that he's uh, that there's certain foods that he cannot eat, but there's something also in the environment. So I will definitely be one of your customers <laughs> for sure. <laughs> As I said before, I'm going to send you guys all samples after the show and everything as well. And um, especially for things like, um, you know, separation anxiety and stuff. Um, there's certain instances where I've seen the CBD oil not work. And that's because certain things weren't taken into consideration. I mean, you can't give CBD to the dog and expect it to be, you know, chilled out if you don't stimulate it, obviously, before, you oh, know. Absolutely. Yeah. So absolutely. there has to be training that has to be involved with it. Um, you know, one customer was like, Mark, your CBD doesn't work. I said, well, you know, is the dog trained properly? Did you exercise it? Well, no. Well, then there you go. If you're not addressing the problem before, whether it's Absolutely. with, you know, with diet or with proper training, um, you know, CBD, as great as it is, there's, you know, it, it complements certain best practices anyways and stuff. You just can't, you know, be lazy, not take your dog out for a walk and then give it CBD and expect it to be relaxed as well, especially for dogs with high anxiety. Yes, um, CBD is great for, you know, situational um, anxiety and behavioral anxiety as well. So if your dog gets scared a little bit before, you know, you go for a car ride and gets anxiety, you give it a dose of CBD and you wait um, 30 minutes and then your dog will be naturally calm in that regard. Um, you know, especially in um, the same with separation anxiety as well. But, you know, with separation anxiety, there's certain training that has to go before that. And then you give the dog CBD to help complement the training as well. So that's always something that um, I recommend to customers as well, is that, you know, if there's something that can be corrected first before C using CBD, then do that first, because then the results there, you're already building the base and then CBD will help complement it in that regard. It's like a holistic approach, right? It, it, it's, yeah. it's like a together thing, like even medication too for anxiety it doesn't work unless you're still working on that separation anxiety, exactly. right? Yeah. yeah. You address the root cause of everything. Yeah. And who do you find is like your your ideal kind of customer who is coming to you? Like what seems to be the underlying issues that most people come to you for help? You know what? Um, I've seen so many issues in terms of um, what CBD can help with as well. Um, I had one customer who uh, unfortunately her dog recently passed away, but um, she was using CBD for the dog's uh, skin cancer. She made one topical formula using the uh, the CBD oil and she actually applied it to the tumor growths and she saw that the tumor growths did um, actually start to reduce in size and everything as well. Um, you know, most common thing is probably anxiety for dogs and um, especially for a lot of senior dogs with pain issues with um, arthritis and um, inflammation as well. I, I'd say those are the preliminary the two biggest ones, but um, also seeing a rise in seizures um, as well. and you know, a lot of um, dog owners are now becoming more educated now and knowing the benefits of CBD and, you know, seeing the debilitating effects of, um, you know, pharmaceutical medication and everything as well. And just seeing CBD as an alternative, um, you know, medicine as well and stuff. But like I said, CBD isn't um, an elixir of life. It does improve the quality of life at the end of the day. But, um, you know, there's obviously um, medicine that, you um, you know, has to be looked at first and foremost before CBD and everything as well. Um, you know, just about a month ago, we had to put down our family dog, Marley. And, um, you know, unfortunately, that was due to kidney failure. You know, CBD in that instance couldn't help her and stuff. So, I mean, just like with every other kind of treatment as well, there's, you know, some things that work and some things that don't work. But um, especially for end-of-life dogs, you know, CBD is a fantastic way just to give them comfort at the end of the day. And, um, you know, that's the best that we can do at owners at that point and stuff. It's so awesome. And would you describe like the people who come to you as educated people that they have gone to their vets and they haven't kind of got the results that they wanted from the treatments? Yeah, some are just looking at um, alternative therapies as well. Um, you know, they see even the cost of certain medications and everything as well. If they look at it, that it can be, you know, um, very expensive as well to treat, um, you know, 
pets and everything, um, especially if you don't have pet insurance. But um, you know, others, you know, the customers, you know, they do know what the uh, you know the side effects are of certain medication as well. And that's why they see CBD as a great alternative in that regard as well. That's so cool. And how much can somebody expect to pay for CBD oil? Like, say, if they have like a medium sized dog for a month, like, what could they be expecting to pay? Um, it depends. Currently, right now, we offer a 500 milligram that retails in stores for $80. And we also have an 1000 milligram that retails for $135. So it really goes, it depends on your use. I mean, if your dog is a medium sized dog, and um, you know you're treating it every day for say pain management then then you'll need a bottle of the 500 milligram a month but if it's something that's you know sporadic and you're treating it for your car rides then you know you may be a long weekend away that um, your dog gets anxious on those long car rides up to the cottage as well so you may be using it sparingly and in that regard it really depends on the usage and um, you know the dog size as well and everything but for medium-sized dog i say about um, a month in that regard Cool. Um, what would you say to people who are looking to buy like how would you spot a reputable seller of cbd oil like is there any warning signs that somebody should watch out for that this might not be the best person to buy from um i think knowing that a lot of the community feedback is well go with a company that's very well reputable and you know peer reviewed as well there are a lot of cbd companies out there and um you know you know who where are you getting it from as well? I have total transparency. I show people with CBD how how it's made, what it looks like, um, and I'm kind of the face of you know the company as well, and you know people that are accessible as well because people do have a lot of questions as well. But make sure that CBD is um, CO2 extracted, and um, just because when it's not extracted using CO2, that's when all the other solvents are used in it, and it's it's not the greatest quality and the purity as well with it um, as well. With our CBD oil, we only use two ingredients, MCT carrier, coconut carrier oil and the CBD itself. Um, there's no fillers, no synthetic flavors or anything like that in that regard and stuff. So what you get for the dog is, you know, it's the best. I mean, as you saw with the CBD and stuff, it's thick like a molasses like this. So, you know, it's kind of hard to be delivery system to have to consume it like this and everything as well. So that's why, um, you know, when it's bottled, it's heated and then we mix it with the coconut oil and then bottle like, um, into the oil as you see it so the the guys who come to you for help what would be the number one issues that you would see that the reasons why somebody is looking at cbd oil for the dog the number one issue would be well it's, it's probably two issues it's like i mentioned before it's the arthur it's the pain the arthritis the anxiety um sorry sorry it's the arthritis and the anxiety that are the two biggest issues and would there be any possible side effects that like come from the dogs or like, is it possible to overdose them and give them the wrong amount? Would there be any side effects if anything like that happened? You know what? I have a 10 pound Jack Russell at home. I've given her, you know, five times the amount of the dosage and everything. And um, she's just basically had a nice nap. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> There wasn't, there hasn't been really any side effects in that regard um, and stuff. But don't get me wrong, there's a lot of um, studies that still need to be done and everything as well. And um, you're starting to see more and more clinical research coming out because uh, you know CBD is, um, you know, it affects humans as well. But let's see the effects in you know dogs and cats and horses as well. So um, under the Canon Canine website, I always keep the um, the site updated with news and resources. With, late, with the latest um, clinical trials and scientific trials. And these are scientific papers that have the effects of, you know, CBD and diabetes, CBD and arthritis, and um, all these reviews. And they show that CBD does actually help with these um, conditions and issues. Well, that's so amazing. Just to be able to see the resources and research, like Susanna loves her research studies and she would find them super interesting. So where can people find out more about you, are you on social media? What's what's the website that people need to go to to check out more and be able to read up on these studies? Yeah, definitely. You can uh, check out canacanine.ca. We're also on Twitter, Snapchat, and Instagram at canacanine. And um, yeah, all of our information is there and we keep it updated with um, case studies, with stories, new product updates all the time. And just more information as well. I also recommend your viewers to uh, email me at info at canacanine.ca 
if they have any questions or comments, I'll get back to every one of them. That is amazing. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're going to pop all that information into the show notes so everybody be able to come back and find it and be on the barkshow.doc. So anybody who's catching the replay or listening to this as a podcast, it's if you go to the barkshow.doc, all the information and resources will be there about Canna Canine. And thanks again, Mark. That was super informative and so helpful to so many. Thank thanks you for again. having me. Thanks. Thanks. Have a great day. Bye. Bye. Pam, I love how we both asked them the same thing about overdosing and side effects. <laughs> <laughs> just to double check everything, right? <laughs> you hear it with so many, you're just like, because it's not proven and some people are out there and you see so many, so much stuff across Facebook, all this kind of stuff. So I think people need to hear it over and over again before they'll be like, ah, okay. Love it. And I also, and that kind of goes into our, one of our topics today too, about choosing the right, you know, tools and, and resources and the trainer too. So like, this is great. Yeah. It's like, no matter what it is, you hear it over and over. If they only hear it the one time, they're not going to remember it. So that's why I'm like, such an awesome product. And that's what I think my mom, and I just don't know about the legality status because she's in Ireland of how that actually works because I know even they're having trouble with people wanting to use for their their children like some lady marched like all across Ireland to raise awareness that the the CBD oil for her child and like they wanted to throw her in jail and stuff because yeah wanted to use CBD oil for her child who was having seizures and all this kind of stuff but it was working for her. like to have to go to such a such crazy lens to get something that's not yeah. like illegal like technically like it's not it, there's it's not cannabis it, but they so. think it is right like yeah. they're you know some people are just they don't want to open their minds to anything else and they stay just uneducated which is unfortunate because it's hurting the children and people that need to use it unfortunately right i mean yeah. i love it for my back i've never changed it i would never use any drugs or like painkillers for my back <laughs> honestly <laughs> i know <laughs> You must tell us how you get on and then is it Kingsley with the allergies that you're going to try it on? Yes. So Kingsley, no medication has worked. No ointments have worked. A coconut oil I've used for the longest time too, but it's not working anymore. Uh, it's just, it, it's really, it, it's getting to be more and more raw. So it, it starts with like a brownish skin and it's blonde and white skin. So it becomes brown and now it's becoming more red and more, more, more pronounced. And then again, we have King, Katie and Bella, and of course they're going to help him lick it. So, <laughs> you know, I can't win here because I can't supervise them all the time. I work too. Oh, it must be so awful. There must be something triggering it around this time of year or and it's so impossible to find yeah. out. We can because I paid over like $5,000 just to test it. And like, they told me poultry and I'm like, yeah, I know. We already knew that, but thank you. Oh, wow. Well. well, keep us posted. Definitely. We will have to come back and revisit it and see because you'll only excited. know how it works. So I would be so good if it works for him because that cannot be cannot be a nice thing for him to deal with all the scratching and the itching. Like, at least we can no. do something for ourselves. But like, yeah, I, I just can't. You know, it's hard for me because like I can't make that that itch or that feeling mm -hmm. stop. Right. And then I'm like, I'm looking at him. He's not enjoying running because then he wants to roll around in grass, which makes it worse. You know, it's, oh. you know, my little baby. Oh, well, keep us posted anyway. So if we just move on to our next segment, yes. you're going to tell us about a new study, girl, you love your studies, <laughs> that's linking owner and pet behavior. So tell us more because I have no idea about what you're going to go through. So I'm so interested to hear it all. So honestly, to tell you the truth, I kind of, this topic was really good because uh, it's going to intro something that we're going to talk about next week. And I really don't want to give it away, but <laughs> there will be things from this topic, this journal article that we're going to be discussing next week. Um, and I really hope everybody can sh join us because it's going to be a lot of research um, covering everything that I say. Um, so I'm excited. So um research from penn vet school links owner and pet behavior so this is one of my favorite topics with dog training uh correlation between aversive to tools and aggressive dog behavior shocking i know right <laughs> Damn, right <laughs> yeah, <super> shocking. <laughs> so shocking um so to go into the article so research from james serpel um 
He is um, a professor of ethics and animal welfare at Penn's School of Vet Medicine. He brings uh, to light new research that associates certain aversive behavior problems in owners with aggressive behavior in their pets too. So this is not just uh, the tools. It's also the aggressive behavior or any other kind of sort of a behavior that, um, that would be aversive with the aggression uh, in dogs. So the research also looked into the role of hormone training methods play in this relationship as well. Uh, so the study was done with uh, Nicholas Dodman. So I'm, I'm sorry if I mispronounced their names. So it's, he works at the Center for Canine Behavior Studies and Dorothy Simono Brown. So she uh, is a former pen vet research and now she's at Martingale Consulting. So they had data from 1,564 dog owners about their personalities training habits and mental health using online questionnaires. So the results shows that the research found that small but significant connections between owners use of confrontational training methods and behavioral problems among dogs. So this also kind of shows, it goes to show that again, they say significant but it's only because it's only about 1500 dogs, right? So if we had more data too, it would lead us to more and, and more significant results in, in, in research, right? So um, harsh methods of training dogs, such as beating or using shock collars, correlated to aggressive habits, such as persistent barking towards the owner and strangers and separation anxiety. So again, if you know anything about me, you will know that I am very research-based and I'm aware of all the aversive techniques because of the field that I'm in. I'm a behavioral analyst for humans. So I totally understand the punishment and punishment related uh, procedures and methods. However, we have more and more research articles and, and more research for the last 30, 40 years that is telling us that harsh methods of training dogs do lead and are cor highly correlated with um, aggressive behaviors in dogs and separation anxiety. So in addition, owners with higher scores of emotional stability also reported less instances of their dogs urinating in the house when left alone. So again, emotional, like the way we also act around the dogs, it is represented in our dogs. So we, I, I feel like we don't need a research study to prove this. However, it's really good to have research to correlate it with what we're talking about. Uh, the study also found a correlation between the prevalence of male depression and the training tactics used on their dogs. So the study found that men who exhibited more moderate depression were five times more likely to report using harmful training methods on their dogs compared to women without a depression. Again, it's not shocking to me because, you know, when you do have a mental health uh, difficulty, studies um, definitely will find higher correlation between being more aggressive towards the dog. Um, so, so Pearl also told um, about um, when, so I'm going to read the quote as well right now. So when we went back and researched the literature on depression in men and women, we found that they tend to express depression in different ways. Men have a tendency to become aggressive or short-fused, whereas women seem to internalize their depression more. So definitely, I would love to see more research on uh, this topic, like the influence on mental health and uh, dog training and then the behavior in dogs. Um, it's slightly worrisome implication for the promotion of the use of dogs for ex-servicemen with post-traumatic stress disorder. So there's a lot of uh, dogs that can be incredibly beneficial um, to them, but we also need to alert the public for the possibility of owners lashing out against their dogs. Because again, when you have PTSD as well, Yes, there's a huge benefit of having dogs, but then again, at the same time, is if we do not control our emotions around them, um, people tend to become more aggressive about dogs, um, and then dogs, in, in result, become more aggressive with their behaviors. Um, so there was another study that used similar results, that they found similar result, the results at the University of Vienna. I love my good Europe <laughs> with all these articles. Uh, so uh, the dogs in their experiment mimic the actions and methods their owners use in the um, doing training trials. Pam and our viewers, to whoever's watching us, like, um, what do you think about this article? Do you um, agree with this article? Do you think more research needs to be done? Any well, examples? Just, like, 
you know, like even when you're dog training, you always tell them, don't train your dog when you're in a bad humor. Because yes. you have short fuse, like you're not whether you like you're not gonna give your dog everything you need to give your dog. So I'm assuming it's the same when you're in depression, you you have a different mindset. You're not seeing things the way they are. And yeah. they're not the only probably asking them, throw my ball, and they might be just like, get away from me with your ball. Like I just don't want to know. And yeah. I can just see that like your your mental state definitely affects your dog and what like it affects your behavior like in so many different ways. But I can imagine that they're saying that like it, it turns to be more aggressive in men. But I I think there needs to be more done to see exactly what what like more in depth study like of their actual mental health like because I'm assuming they were probably self diagnosed in order to say I have depression and this kind of stuff. So I definitely oh. think it's always always do a thing with that. keep yourself upbeat and if you're not in a good humor don't be doing it because like i can imagine it really affects the pet's mind and because they don't understand what they've done wrong you know what i i always 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 say this i remembered an instance a couple of years ago when i lived on queen street west um there was this guy apparently a trainer told him to slap his dog if the dog is pulling so the guy definitely um had some sort of um Maybe he was having a bad day. I'm not sure what was happening. So I, me being me, you know, <laughs> I stopped and I'm like, hey, um, do, do you need any help? Like, what's happening? He literally lashed out on me. Um, he called me. Um, I'm not going to say the word. Mm -hmm. Starts with an F. Liberal. Um, don't know why that has anything to do with anything. Um, so that just kind of tells me that he was having a bad day, but you can see that his behavior influenced the dog to want to run away from him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he was like trying to choke the dog back, slapping him. And I'm like, Oh God. So then he gave me his business card. Turned out to so that he owned some sort of, um, tutoring company for kids like in math. And I'm like, is this how you teach kids as well? Because, Oh my gosh, I'm going <laughs> to report you. <laughs> Oh, you do that to, to a dog, what are you going to do to a child? Like, Seriously. I I couldn't believe it. Like, I'm like, you teach kids, and yet this is how you are with dogs. I mean, kids, dogs are not kids, don't get me wrong, mm -hmm. but it's just the way your attitude is. I could never comprehend how can you be in a teaching position if you have no patience whatsoever. Yeah. I just wonder, though, where, where he learned, like, that you need to slap the dog and... All those trainers that I'm going to talk about today, you know, in a civil way, stay tuned, guys. It's going to get heated. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely will. So, moving on to something that's still very serious, but we all need to know. So, guys, what what would be the first thing you would do if your dog went missing? Oh my like, gosh, this is scary. This is so scary to even think about, but it's good that we're talking about because it happens all the time. Yeah, and it's it's just like in any other case, like the first 24, 48 hours are super important. And the more the likeliness that you will actually get your dog back. So if anybody has lost their dog and they have gotten back, we'd love for you to share your, your happy story in the comment section. Because there so many dogs go missing. I get tagged in so many posts on Facebook and on Twitter asking me to share like that the dog has gone missing. And in some of the situations, it might be because they left their dog tied up to a lamppost. So please, 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 I cannot tell you enough. It is not worth the risk to lose your dog because you wanted to bring them to the shop that you didn't have the time to walk them. Don't walk your dog. I would be happier if you didn't walk your dog and they literally only got out for a potty break. Then you bring them to the store and you tie them up to out. Up, up, like, I'm sorry, I'm getting all, I'm getting all heated <laughs> because I just can't. I, it just really bothers the hell out of me. When I go to I go to the store and I see two to three dogs tied up outside, some might be anxious, some might be okay, but I'm just saying to myself, how much would it take for me to go and take that dog and just take that dog home? And then it's not even that they're going to take your dog. What are they going to do to your dog if they take them? So don't put yourself in a situation where you're going to be blaming yourself because if it's a lost dog. If you can't take your dog where you're going, leave them at home. So I'm going to go through a few steps that you will need to take. So if you want to just go ahead and you can type lost into the comment section right now, we'll be able to send you a guide, especially if you're in Toronto. It has lots of resources and places that you will need to hit up straight away if your dog does go missing. 
So first thing that you will need to do is search the immediate area. So depending on your dog's personality, the chances are that he has not probably gone that far. So get a friend to help get a neighbor and go around the surrounding area get yourself have yourself armed with treats and just be constantly calling them as you're walking around so if you're doing that like you want to have the bag rustle the bag you know your dog you know what your what, what will make your dog come back to you so if it's just the noise of a treat bag and we all know like the dog could be asleep might not be listening to your call them but you make a rustle of like a piece of paper that might sound like there's food now and all of a sudden they can hear you so definitely always have something with you have your treats because some like depending on your dog's personality again they might be a bit skittish they might not be 100 percent with their recall so have that with you and then if you don't have anything you're and you're out of luck leave an item that smells like you like a t-shirt or something like that in front of your front of your house in front of your property so they can they can like the dog's nose is the best so just make sure that you do that that does also helps with getting the back the next thing you will want to do, you want to alert shelters and rescues. So while you are searching for a pet, like I, I would actually say, ask your friend to start making those calls for you. Somebody who's familiar with your dog. So you want to call them and give a super detailed description of your dog. Be as descriptive as possible about their appearance. If they have any markings, if they had a collar on, what they were wearing, because some dogs might have them some kind of clothes on. So you want to be super descriptive because if if your dog happens to be there and like it's a like a certain kind of like dog that could be like a pot cake or something that like there might be a lot of dogs that end up in the rescue who are similar to the breed you want to be super descriptive as possible and there is no such thing as too much information when it comes to describing your dog so get get a neighbor get a friend somebody who knows your dog to make those calls for you so you're not going to be wasting time making those calls when you can be out looking for your baby so the next thing you want to do is call the veterinarians in your area. So the first thing somebody does generally when they find a dog, they will, if they don't have a collar on that with their, with their contact information, the next thing they will do is bring it to a vet. So they bring it to a vet because they can actually scan the microchip. Hopefully there is a microchip that's there. They can scan the microchip and be able to find the owner. So that will happen. But also there is cases where there is no microchip and the veterinary clinic more than likely will hold on to the dog. So they will get approached by somebody who has found your dog or they might hold on to your dog or they will be able to microchip and check your dog. So make sure you call all the veterinarians in your area. And even if like go further afield, make as many calls as possible. And again, get somebody else to make the calls for you because you want to be out there looking for your dog. So get a close family friend or neighbor to do that for you. So the next thing you want to do is check shelters. So if your dog ha happened to be picked up by animal control, they're going to be in a shelter. So even if you filed a loss report, check them every few days and make sure that they haven't seen any new dogs. And what they kind of said is like so many dog descriptions aren't enough that if your dog is a black dog, they might describe your dog as a brown dog. So you want to make sure that like it's a brown black dog. You want to be as descriptive as possible. And make sure that like they don't miss that your dog comes in because they they're inundated with the amount of dogs that um are constantly surrendered or they pick up on the streets. So you want to make sure that as detailed as possible, so you're not leaving room for error and constantly be calling back, calling back, calling back, just to say, hey, did you what dogs came in today? And let them even talk back to you because there will be stuff that they say. Then you'd be like, oh, oh, that could possibly be my dog. So make sure you keep on top of that. The next thing you want to do is utilize social media. And personally, I've known people who have actually lost their dog. And by the use of social media from Instagram and being shared across, they act, the dog actually found their way home. So it's so great to see that it works. So it's probably the one of the most powerful tools. You will always see people on Facebook share, share, share. Like nobody is not going to share that your dog is missing. People know it's a part of your family. They know it's your baby. So the first thing you want to do is make sure you get a great colored picture of your dog, put their description in the area that they were lost. And even if you have one or two photos, like especially if your dog might like not be looking at the camera. So and I always know like you will be in a state of panic because your dog is lost. And even if you want to give that task again to somebody else to do so they can pick two good pictures of your dog that they can be used. So also on your Facebook status, make sure that you actually write that 
in the in the uh, privacy settings you want to select set it to public because there's no point then in people sharing your lost dog if the settings are closed and the image won't be displayed so make sure that's really important that you have public on the privacy settings so that will enable sharing and be able for it to go viral if your dog has been lost for an extended period of time i would consider them making a facebook page dedicated to finding your dog there has been so many happy endings that you, you do see on facebook that the dog might be missing for months like and and they're found because the owners are resilient in making sure that there's no way that i'm never going to find my dog so like using the using the facebook page is really really great to do and instagram and twitter are just as good but facebook would be the number one that you will get the most shares out of but as i said before my friend found his dog from instagram so it's super important you make a post on instagram you tag the world in that post you tag all your friends so they get a notification and because they've been tagged they're more than likely going to share share your post because they know you have tagged them so use hashtags such as lost dog lost dog toronto missing dog where it was like so put as much information in there as possible and have a great picture so the next thing you want to do is monitor craigslist and kijiji because some people will put up that they found a dog lost dog but then there's people that will try and sell your dog. Like people, oh, like I can't. this is the worst. This is the worst part about it is because you don't know why they have they have stolen your dog. Oh. Is it because you're? It's a purebred. Is it because that it would be a great lure dog? Like is it because that like oh he'd be great for like a great stud dog? And this is just the worst part ever. Like your dog means the world to you, but you like the people who take them. Could be using them as a bait dog like in fighting rings and all this kind of stuff and it's just the, it's the saddest thing ever because there is sick people out there there is people who who run this like they would be doing gambling on on fighting rings and uh, there wasn't too long ago that there was one outside ontario that was found like that the dogs were all tied up in the woods and it's just it's just so sad so that's what i go back to again never leave your dog tied up outside like i see people who leave their dog tied outside and I've gone in, I'm 10 minutes doing my shopping and I come back out, the dog is still there. I'm like, how long was the dog there before I got there? And then he's still there and I'm just like, I, I, I literally feel like I'd love to give them a fright and say, what if your dog was gone? Like, if I just I have around. a story. I have a story. Tell me. Can I share my story? Yeah. So the lovely people, when I lived in Queen West, there was Fresh Go, like I, I lived at Queen of Gladstone, right? So they were shopping at Fresh Go, apparently. They were there, they left, they left the dog in front, the dog chewed through the leash. Of course, me coming in, you know, took the dog. I left my information with the store and I called the police and I told the police, hey, I have the dog. Um, if they come back, can you please make sure that, you know, you send someone to come in or how they can appropriately get the dog, right? So mm -hmm. lucky for me, people at the police were such good, friendly people and they love dogs. So they said, uh, they will get somebody with the police, like to come and then take. They'll take the dog personally and take them to the owners, right? And they did that the day after. I named her Poopsie because she pooped in my house as soon as she walked in. Uh, it was Bella's third or fourth birthday, I can't remember. So Bella got to spend the night with like this cute little Pomeranian. But the mm -hmm. funny story is, the police actually shook them up really good, and I actually because we shopped there. Well, David did a lot. Mm -hmm. So they said that they never brought the dog afterwards. Yeah, like that's so they gave it. him a warning. Like, oh, it is when, great. Like you're trying to double job with your dog. Okay, I haven't walked my dog yet, but I need to go to the store. Uh, I'll just take the dog to the store because, like, it's a good like twenty minute walk, so the dog will get her walk in, and then I don't have to to worry about walking the dog. But I'm just like, it's how, how is that worth it? Like. <sighs> Like we people aren't yeah. like well, people aren't good. People aren't gonna think like oh great dog, they say hello to him, walk off. People will actually take your dog. And nobody's really gonna bat an eyelid if the dog doesn't really want to go. And if you have a small dog, what are the chances? Like somebody could come along and pick up my dog and she would go with them. Yeah, like, same with my dog. Well, Kingsley wouldn't. Kingsley likes me, so Kingsley <laughs> wouldn't. But like Bella and Katie three hugs and pets and kisses whatever we're going yeah like that's just the thing like that 
I always say like if the, if my place got robbed, like Holly would be like, hey, welcome, I'll hold the <laughs> flashlight for you. Like, yes. but, like it's so friendly and like it because it would probably depend on the situation where she was, but even if she didn't want to go with them, what chance would she have? She's a shih tzu, like they can pick her up. She's not gonna bite them because like she doesn't have that in her. Like she might not want to go and she'd be like, like where are you taking me? But they can easily do that pop her in the car and it's five seconds and she's gone because I wanted yeah. Daisy to take her for a separate walk and I thought that bringing her to the store was fine no way no way I would hope Katie because she's a gangster dog from the streets I would hope that she'd put up a little fight but she's like no she loves people she's just like you know just love me love yeah. me yeah. you know because we don't you love in your head that like this person is gonna look like a big gangster or like a creep or whatever where like if somebody came along and they were like super high pitched, Katie, let's go for a walk or double. Oh, she... like, no, nope, yeah. 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 Goodbye, like, Katie, forever. <laughs> I'm not going to stand out to anybody that, like, hey, maybe this isn't their dog. Unless your dog has high anxiety and is barking from the rooftops. That drives me crazy, too. Do not take your dog to the store if they have anxiety. <laughs> Yes, not only that, but when they tie them close to the road too, or or when it's icy and it's cold outside, and your dog's freezing because your dog goddamn selfish, and you can't just provide exercise differently, you know. Again, I get super passionate about this. Maybe I should go into this. <laughs> <laughs> I know, like I can't even get my words out. I, can't I gotta restrain myself physically and mentally when I talk about this. <laughs> oh, I know. So we move on. Just keep this going and get this list down, guys. So type in "lost" into the comment section, and we'll send you the to-do list because it's not at the time of your dog where you need to be turned to Google. You want to have some resource saved. So if the if this ever happens. It's simple. You just go to your list and you start building through. So the next one you can do is create a flyer. So you want the flyer to post it on telephone poles inside local businesses, go to the vets, put a detailed description in it and say where the dog was last seen. So there's a, also a great resource that's free to everybody. It's called Helping Lost Pets. So they will actually make the flyer for you put the information that they want you that like is very important to have on it. And then you can use that to share all over social media. So by just sending them the image, they can do everything for you once you send it to them. So it's helping lost pets. And we will put that in the show notes as well. So as a good resource, and it's also included in the, in the resource, if you type lost into the comment section, the next thing you want to do is go door to door. You never know that the dog just went somewhere and went up to a neighbor and the neighbor's like, oh, are you lost? And they just took them in. So they might not be so quick to get out there and say, I found a dog. So go door to door and have your flyers with you say, have you seen this dog? Because more than likely a neighbor could have picked them up, especially if they're a small dog. And they'd be like, oh, come on in. I know you're lost. And then they're looking for a collar and they're just slow about getting out there and going to the vets, going to see if they have a microchip. So in other situations, then you can also seek professional help. There are people out there, trained professionals who use bloodhounds that can be utilized to track the scent of your dog, particularly if your pet may be hiding in a wooded area or like if you're outside the city. While success is not guaranteed by this, the approach is certainly worth the effort in finding a beloved lost pet because I will do it. Like if Absolutely. somebody can just help me quickly get there like a professional, that they have the tools to do it, I would be 100% on board. So just for our local Toronto people listening, the resources that you would want to be doing is helpinglostpets.com. They will give you the, they'll create your flyer for you that you can share across social media. Toronto Animal Services, so you want to check um, if they picked up your dog. Toronto Animal Shelters, they also give you a list of all the current pets that are being in their care, so that have been brought in to all different means. There is a registry of lost pets on toronto.ca. And then there is numerous resources on Facebook where you would share that your dog is lost. So again, type lost into the comment section. This will be all there. This will be your go-to guide if you happen to lose your dog and you're in the city of Toronto. But you also have the steps and processes if you're not in the city of Toronto and as in where, what you would be looking for. So type lost into the comments and spot our dog bot will send you all the resources because it's too much of a panicky situation if you lose your dog that you're just not going to think straight and get all this done so it's just something for that hopefully you will never ever have to have to use so Susanna what do you think like 
Have you ever experienced? You've never had any of your no, dogs. No, my dogs don't run away from me. I mean, Katie, Katie just goes in the bushes and does her own thing. She comes back, right? But I know where she's at, right? Um, there was one incident when she wants to go after Bruce, you know, but the Bruce's, Bruce's van was like right there when um, he was being picked up. And I'm like, really, Katie? She doesn't want to lose her friend. But like, no, my dogs have never ran away from me. Mm -hmm. There was an instance when I was puppy sitting a dog where a husky just came out of nowhere, jumped. I actually had scratches all over me because like tackled me. I fell down and the dog was let go because mm -hmm. I you know, like I, I fell down. Right. And, yeah. uh, and was trying to get myself away from the Husky, but this dog ran to the condo. So there was no main street or anything. So he just ran to the condo, which was good, mm -hmm. but you know what? It could have happened then because there was no owner for the Husky jumping all over me, scratching me, biting me. Right. This actually happened a couple of years ago. And then thankfully there were cameras of the building. So we were able to locate the owner of the Husky. Mm -hmm. So it was like, oh, it, it was a stressful situation. So, and he wasn't even involving the dog running, running, running away, right? He just ran yeah. to the building and it was stressful. So I can only imagine how it is when your dog legit gets lost. Mm -hmm. And I can only imagine what's going on through your dog's mind too. Yeah, they would right? be terrified. And then if they had something that shook them up, like most dogs go missing, like, all around the holidays that, like, the fireworks are going off because they were bolt. Oh, Nothing is people are not prepared. Yeah. Or we'll, we'll go through that a whole other day because <laughs> we could literally talk forever. And again, as we keep on going on, we're going to try our best to stick to time. So <laughs> good luck. I know we, we are so bad. Good luck. <laughs> we could turn anyway. this into a whole day, you guys. Like we are really that bad. <laughs> well, today we had a really good information for the first part of the show. And like mm -hmm. I thought that, you know, we can't really cut that off. So, because it was really useful information about CBD oil, and that's something that a lot of uh, pet owners need to know. Like, they need to know the stigma behind it, too. And he was so good about talking about the positive side effects and the actual side effects and the more research needs to be done and what's it used for. So, we needed to do that. Oh, for sure. Like, I would keep going and going and going, but... Like, just to be able to get the word out and help the dogs, like, anything that can help dogs, like... I'm always 100% behind. Oh, absolutely. Me too. And, you know, it, it was useful information for sure. So everybody listening, go ahead oh. and leave the comments. And I want you to do this even if you're listening to this on the replay. What would be the number one thing you would look for when you're looking for a dog trainer? <laughs> and I don't know what Susanna is going to go through, but I'm going to take a leap ahead of and I'm going to say, the one thing that you don't look for is results. Don't be looking for a result driven trainer because I can just see that. Like, I'm not going to say any more because I'm assuming it's probably going to be in there somewhere. But that's the one <laughs> thing that you wouldn't look for. Whereas that's probably what most people would think about is the result. What's the end result? What 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 am I going to get back out of my dog? So, Susanna, I want you to tell us more about the super important topic about how to choose a good dog trainer. Pam, I can talk about this for the next year. I feel like the information that I have is really good, but I feel like there could be more <laughs> always. So I just want to add to your thing. I, I can't even tell you the amount of dog trainers that trained all these dogs that I got to, you know, work with, with their owners, um, with uh, promising results. Uh, promising, oh no, they'll, they'll take care of it and they'll do the board and train and your dog's going to be fixed and perfect or just keep the shock collar on them and everything's going to be fine, you know, and they're not going to engage in anything else. So um, choosing a dog trainer is, is, is one of the most important decisions that you're going to have to make uh, when it comes to regarding to your dog, right? Uh, but it also can be an extremely uh, difficult decision to get right because again, there are so many trainers that call themselves dog trainers. There are so many, there's so much information out there. There's so much marketing, right? Um, so people claiming to be only dog trainers in the world who hold the key to lifelong obedience or happiness, or they offer guarantees, which I always say red blank. You should never go with a trainer that offers, that guarantees results. It, you, you cannot guarantee results, right? Especially when you're training with those dogs and then they go back to their owners, especially their, their board and train, right? Or if we're training together, unless the um, 
um, people are training with their dogs, things are not going to, you know, get trained. The dogs are not going to get trained and things are not going to get done. So please, please avoid um, pack leaders, uh, people that call themselves pack leaders, uh, others that charge more per hour than trained human psychologists do not get fooled, right? They're, this is where I also draw the line to. Psychologists will go to school for how many years, right? Their hours will be like three, four hundred dollars an hour. So why, you know, you, you can't really pay um, a dog trainer that you don't know where they got their credentials from. You don't know how long they went to school. You don't know if they have so many resources or not. You just, you know, you just don't know, right? So don't be fooled by that either. So how do you navigate through this minefield of options and emerge with a truly qualified positive trainer who will work with you and your dog using modern free science-based tools and techniques? Any ideas, Pam? Oh, I can't even imagine where you're going to, like, <laughs> positive can be totally misinterpreted by people yeah. who are using positive. So what would you say to people who are like, I want a positive reinforcement because it's coming, becoming like a trend, kind of just a, a term to pop out there. But yeah, oh, yeah, like they might then just like, they're good at talking and they can be just like, they, they're good at saying, oh, well, this is what I'm going to do. And then like giving a good sales pitch about how it's positive, but it's, it's not positive. I love when I see on Instagram, oh, I'm a positive dog trainer. And yeah, there's a prong collar on your dog. <laughs> I'm like, there's nothing positive about it. <laughs> yeah, like, I would say watch out for keywords such as pack leader, dominance. A lot of people are confused about what dominance is too. I like to use the word bully, not dominant, you know, mm -hmm. uh, because there can be a lack of social skills. It can be a lack of training. It can be, it can be a lack of, uh, you know, socialization. It can be so many different things, right? And I'm not going to get into that right now. Um, I would um, also see how they are with your dog. Are they trying to intimidate your dog? Because there's mm -hmm. so many dog trainers that call themselves positive dog trainers. But I'm like, but do you know what positive reinforcement is? Like, I would ask them, what's reinforcement? Mm -hmm. What does my dog get when they get it right? What does my dog get when they get it wrong? Like, you know, how do we move forward, right? It's kind of key terms, mm -hmm. um, I would say. And I would also say, um, look for their qualifications. But then again, that also doesn't mean that there are a positive dog trainer or a good dog trainer, right? So like there's a lot of things that we kind of need to have in consideration, which I'm going to kind of talk about once we get into the topic too. Um, I find that, you know, when people actually um, make the decision that they need a dog trainer, that's also a very stressful thing for them as well, because then they are, you know, calling and researching information. And then, you know, some people are also scared of being judged, right? They're scared about, oh, well, our dog was fine. And now, you know, our dog is barking at everything. Our dog is anxious right now. What did we do wrong, right? So I would also say, please um, ask, like, look for a dog trainer too that's not going to make you feel that, you know, you did, um, that you are a failure or, you know, that they're going to be judging you uh, on what you did thus far, right? A good dog trainer will definitely let you know how to do things proactively and how to get back on track, right? Not judge you, intimidate you, point fingers at you and stuff like that, right? So good dog trainers often find themselves in the awkward position of having to justify their chosen profession because to at least some degree, everyone thinks that they're a dog trainer. And you know what? That's so true because our industry is like dog training industry is so super unregulated, right? Um, and commonly heard... Um, refrain among dog owners is that no one knows my dog like I do. Well, that may be very well be the case. It's not really relevant to whatever, whether or not that makes them the right choice to make dog training decisions, right? And many mm -hmm. dog owners might be proficient handlers. Qualified dog trainers do possess a skill set and information which uh, they have worked very hard to master. And the gap between like a well-meaning intelligent dog owner and a trained professional is wider than many sometimes believe, right? Because again, even um, when you have good training skills too, like, and you're not a dog trainer, you know, they can be seen as defensive. Like if you um, say something, right? Or show something, they're, they're going to be like, yeah, my dog really is my dog. And I know my dog better. And I know this or that. But then again, you know, do you actually know everything about dogs? Even the dog professionals don't, for God's sakes, right? It's, it's a learning field. We're all learning, right? But, like, you need to have those skill sets and information that you might not really have access to 
um, the dog trainers would, right? Um, so it's, it's, it's very possible to, um, have information on internet, right? But then anybody can post anything on internet. Do you believe it? Mm -hmm. You know, um, there's so many books available to which I, I have a really good list of books that I can actually share as well, uh, on dog training. But then again, do you know how to put what you read in a book into practice? Right. Um, so when you are facing behavioral issues, you do need a qualified dog trainer. Um, what you read in a book is not going to be the same thing as you putting into practice as well. Cause you need to practice, you need the skills training. You need somebody that's there training you how to do it. Um, it's been any education though. Like it's like, even if you were going to med school, like you yeah. don't just read the textbook and I'm a doctor, like, like that's literally how some of these are like, they'll publish all this stuff and then people read it and then people take the nonsense in, on board because that person might be just really good at yeah. what they're saying. And it's the same, like when you come like, like Cesar Milan was probably before the internet, he was the guy on the television. He was the guy that people listened to because they thought they, he was getting the results, like a highly edited show that like, that was out there and it was on all our TV screens. And that's why you like it's so hard for I think some people to not like even when they get a dog to not think that he's not doing the right thing because they're like Caesar yeah. this Caesar this the dog whisper and I suppose even as you were saying earlier when like terms that they describe people like if somebody described themselves as a dog whisper what would your reaction be to that? You're not a dog whisperer, I would say. <laughs> like, even when people tell me the same thing, I'm like, I'm not a dog whisperer. I know behavior. So mm -hmm. I know dog body language. I like, I, this is what I do, right? And funny thing about Cesar Milan, I was watching his videos, okay? And me being in behavioral field, he's missing crucial opportunities to reinforce and punish too. Like, you know, if you're going to go down that route, you need to have perfect timing for the punishment. Because if you miss it, then your dog doesn't know what he's getting punished for. What are you correcting your dog about, right? Oh, I can go about this. You need to, we need to have a slumber party and just like go all night about this, right? And I can shut down anybody who's going to tell me this or not. I'm like, I am science-based. I know behavior. Like I'm in the field, right? I'm not saying I'm know-it-all, but I know crucial opportunities to reinforce and punish. So like we can chat about those kind of things, right? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, Cesar Milan is definitely not a dog whisperer. No. <laughs> That's something, you know, I would say, avoid avoid and avoid people that use that terminology um and again not to go off topic because we will definitely be talking about this a lot more when you use punishment you need to teach replacement behaviors mm -hmm. um if you just use punishment alone it's not going to work you need to teach replacement behaviors reinforce that's the best way the punishment will work but hey a lot of people don't know that unfortunately so you know Again, I will talk about this. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are a lot of options out there. And, they, and I can tell you from my experience, just being in Toronto, for God's sakes, there's not a lot of good dog trainers. Um, you know, there is more positive movement, which I love to see. I love, love, love to see. But unfortunately, unfortunately, and I know this is a very controversial topic. Unfortunately, even these positive dog trainers they get a bad name because they actually don't know how to deal with things appropriately, right? They don't know how to deal with reactive dogs appropriately. They don't know how to deal with uh, common behavioral problems appropriately. And I think we need more training and, and more things about it, right? And I'm sorry if I'm offending anybody. Um, my experience so far has been dogs come to me. They've been to positive dog trainers. They've been to aversive dog trainers. And there's no results. There's also like owners to have a a lot to do with that as well but you know what um i also want to ask what's the approach of the dog trainer what did they do what they didn't do right um and this is where you know we're going to talk about how to pick a good dog trainer right there's so many aversive tools out there there's so many uneducated professionals in the field that call themselves a dog trainer um they want to put a shock collar on your dog they don't even know how to use a shock collar they want to put prong on your dog and just chain your dog back and of course dogs going to associate that with the prong or a choke chain choke collar um and of course your dog's not going to engage in anything because your dog's going to be terrified of everything right so if given the choice i'm 100 positive that most people would search for a trainer that would no doubt prefer to find one 
who achieves long-lasting results as quickly as possible using the least amount of force, pain, or intimidation possible. So the problem is that due to a combination of clever marketing from old school traditional trainers and understandable lack of behavioral scientific terminology and expectations, those well-meaning clients to be are frequently duped into hiring dog trainers who prey on their ignorance about the unregulated and confusing um, terminology, uh, technology um, methods that is the professional dog training pool. So if the end result of this deception were the harmless equivalent of choosing an ice cream flavor you didn't like, that would be fine. Unfortunately, however, choosing the wrong dog trainer can have huge negative effects, even fatal results. And you know what? There was uh, this lovely local dog trainer that shocked this lovely dog and there was skin burns on the neck. They ended up going to trial. You know what? All these results of the public um, of the trial are public. So anybody can go and kind of check it out. I don't know the link to it, but I feel like it is the um, the court somewhere close to Young and Finch, actually, in North York. Um, so the family won the case because the trainer was really using aversive uh, methods. And, you know, that's it, right? Like, you, you don't want this to happen to you, right? So there's so many positive um, dog trainers uh, listed on the websites, right? Um, again, I will provide all these links afterwards where you can find a qualified dog trainer that has ethics to follow. That has ethics to follow. Sorry, I, did you say something? Oh no, sorry, I was just having a drink. Maybe the <laughs> went oh, the okay. sorry. <laughs> So, you know, we live in twenty first century. You, we don't need to uh, raise our kids and dogs like we used to, like fifty years ago. Okay, we know better. That's the beautiful thing about science. Okay, um, and there are so many disproven theories about pack leadership, about dominance, about value of punishment, especially with so called red zone dogs, right? So I would say these trainers have seen their profit margins and they, you know, their livelihoods threatened by the steady advance of positive training and the growing awareness among their clients' bases where well, there's a better way to train. And I always said, why would somebody want to put their dogs to punishment procedures where I can show you how to train dogs using positive dog training methods? I can show you how to decrease negative behaviors. I can show you how to work through anxiety. I can show you how to work through aggression reactivity, okay? I get to this point through looking at what are the functions of the behavior. What is the environment like? What is, like, what is everything around like, right? Like, what is your body language, right? But then enough about me. I'm just awesome, right? <laughs> um, so what is a positive training? Um, what do you think, Pam? What is a positive training in your opinion? Well, when a dog does what they want, what you want them to do, that they get rewarded for doing it, and they start to think that they're absolutely awesome for doing what what they want to do. But like always using something that is valuable to the dog, yeah, to do what they want. I always say, like, when you see a dog that's been trained using positive methods, your dog will offer behaviors to you um, in a good way, right? Like you you don't have to force anything, right? You don't need to force anything, and and I know a lot of people, this is a very controversial topic. They think that dog positive dog training is permissive. It's not permissive. I don't allow my dogs to do, you know, just act out or do this or that, right? Like engage in any negative behaviors. Do you know why I don't? Because I train them using positive reinforcement. And, you know, there's still punishment associated with it, but it's not punishment that hurts them. I also use punishment. Like I know, shocking, right? Mm -hmm. But it's that ignoring. It's it's uh, removing items. It's It's not me ever putting physical like i'm getting physical with my dogs or shocking my dogs for doing anything you know my dogs are social creatures if i remove my attention from them let me tell you about that they will you know want my attention so that's enough punishment for my dogs yeah that's, right? a, that's a really big one that like people think punishment is hitting like forcing your dog to do something whereas it can just be no eye contact i'm going to turn my back on you and just other means like it's the word probably sounds a lot harsher than the action like what people would physically think because it's like it's like even if you had a child like yeah the punishment can be just okay you're not going to watch the television like it's just the simple things broken yeah. that 
work for the but dog because the dog or the child finds it valuable. Yeah. But it's people who use these shock collars, e collars, prong collars, you know, physically hitting and injuring the dog. Like, but, but that's inhumane. That's unethical. Like, that's unethical on so many levels. Like, you know, and, and I, and this is what I'm trying to tell people that doesn't work long term. Okay. If you take off that shock collar of your dog, will your dog perform the same behaviors in every environment? No. Okay. Uh, my dogs have real, a reliable recall. I don't need my dogs to have a shock collar on them. Okay. And again, I'm not close minded. Um, if there is by any chance um, a reason why you say to me that my dog needs an e collar and a shock collar and I can't, you know, my dog's gonna get killed, okay, let's see it. Let's see why. Why? Like, give me a good reason why, okay? And then we can talk about it, right? Just give me a good reason why. Like, I'm not going to shut you down. I'm just going to say, I have a bodysuit for dogs that will bite, right? I have worked with extremely aggressive dogs and worked my way through that aggression without punishing any dogs. I love practice strategies and they work. Trust me. Maybe because I'm in the field where I, you know, sometimes I can go to work. Well, not now, but before and I can get killed on a daily basis. But I'm very proactive and I'm very safety uh, based and you can be safe. You can be proactive. So, you know, this is something that I look into in dog trainers, proactivity, being safe, not just reactive. Why do I need to react to things if I can be proactive about it too, right? So let's talk about how you can find a good trainer. I always say, look at the... Um, this article was taken from Victoria Silva, right? Like she's fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, so any dog trainers that come from her, or from Dog Train Academy for Dog Trainers, I would say people that are uh, on um, certified dog training professionals website as well. That's uh, like that's me as well. I'm listed there um, because you know what? This way you'll see that they've done their research. They went to school. They learned. They were trained by people, right? I would also say people that have good people skills, people that don't intimidate you, right? Your trainer needs to be able to listen to your concerns and not feel like you're judging them, right? Your trainer needs to be able to understand that, you know, um, they need to be moving at your pace, right? If they're talking too fast, if they're moving too fast, if they're telling you get your shit together, I'm sorry, that's not a good trainer, right? Um, your trainer needs to understand that how do you learn? Like everybody's a different learner, right? Like, do you learn by modeling? Do you learn by, you know, reading? Do you learn by uh, listening, right? So do you learn by moving, you know? And it's the same thing with dogs too. Your trainer needs to understand how your dog learns as well, as well as you learn, right? Um, I would say using positive methods to address negative behaviors uh, because anyone can teach a dog to sit, stay, or come using positive reinforcement, but it takes a lot more skill, experience, and confidence in positive training techniques to modify unwanted negative behaviors like aggression or separation anxiety. This is a key identifier which separates hybrid trainers that use positive and punishment techniques from truly positive trainers, right? And again, I have so many clients never had to use any aversive stuff. Um, I had a client tell me that, you know, when I first met her, she's like, nope, this is not going to work because I've done the Caesar Milan thing. I went to a balance trainer, you know, uh, nothing has worked. Okay, cool. That was a great challenge for me. And I didn't just talk about it. I showed, I modeled. Mm -hmm. And she was like, oh my gosh. So I helped her so much. Um, just one out of so many, right? You can see um, reviews about me <laughs> everywhere, right? <laughs> um, another thing is to take history of what you did with a dog and about your dog, right? To take the medical history, the training history, talk about everything and just listen about it. Not just come in and assume, oh no, your dog is dominant or, you know, your dog needs to uh, know, learn how to be a pack leader, right? That's BS. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Uh, any trainer that discounts that history of anything that you've done with a dog is not a good trainer, right? Um, I would also see one of the good things to provide client preferences, honestly. A good trainer has nothing to hide. 
Another thing that I also also tell people to like, your trainer needs to train you and your dog and everybody in your household, not board and train. And if they're going to go with board and train, you need to be there for that training as well. Okay. Because consistency is key to effective training. Having liability insurance. I say this all the time. I have it. Every good trainer should have liability insurance. It's a business term. But it's also an important thing to confirm before hiring a trainer. Not only does it suggest a higher level of professionalism and legitimacy, but also protects you and the trainer in case anything goes wrong with the dog. And you know what? Things can go wrong with, with anybody, right? Include you in the training, kind of like I talked about that a little bit. But you need to be a part of the training because you will go home with that dog. You need to learn how to consistently, effectively communicate with uh, your dog and the trainer. And one of the primary goals will be for you to step in and eventually take over the actual training with your dog. So for me is because I'm a behavior analyst. My whole thing is I want to make sure that you take these skills and you can transfer it across everybody, right? So I need to understand that you're good to go with these skills so I can fade myself out. I never guarantee results. I tell them it depends on you. I don't like wasting people's money. So I tell them upfront and personal right away. I'm like, I don't like, we live in Toronto. It's expensive to live here. Mm -hmm. Rates are expensive. I do not want to waste your money. So if you cannot commit to this training right now, then I'm not going to be coming because I don't like wasting time or people's money. So like it has to be, it has to be a two way relationship, right? Like I need to trust you. You need to trust me that this is going to be happening. Right. Um, and I also wanted to say, uh, you need to understand that you're your dog's primary trainer, right? So we need to, um, work together to get to those goals because you need to be able to take those uh, skills and train them when I'm not there. So now I'm going to go into the dog trainers to avoid. Pam, I'm going to turn it to you or to our viewers. What I kind of hinted a little bit here and there, but what would you say, what dog trainers would you want to avoid? Oh, board and train would be on my list. Yes. Like, the amount of times I've heard of send your dog to this miracle boot camp for a week that costs five thousand dollars, and your dog is going to come back and it's going to be perfect. I'm like, no. no, 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 absolutely, absolutely. I'm actually happy that this person is not in dog training anymore. I don't know what this dog trainer is doing, but I'm just really happy that you know they're not training dogs currently. Um, I also wanted to kind of do maybe next week we can do a topic on how to choose a good dog walker too. Mm -hmm. or like when you were away I've, I've had some stories as well that people just right. like you need like you just need the education like and to yeah. know what we're like like everything that you're going through right now is is fantastic but what you're about to do now what to avoid in a dog trainer this is more where like people should be listening what do you need to do to avoid getting a bad dog trainer because some people are just great at talking and selling themselves and selling oh, yeah. the miracles they perform that it's so important to know what to watch out for as well as what to watch for. Well, that's my whole mission in life, right? Uh, and I can tell you, I love the, the positive dog training culture. Uh, we just kind of have to, um, be very careful about how we expose ourselves on the internet too and because people get really defensive so i feel like that's also one of the topics that i want to talk about too how to properly market yourself so other people don't feel so defensive i'd say because these balanced mm -hmm. dog trainers are all about like no you are ridiculous you can't just use positive and i'm like yeah okay i can <laughs> prove it but that's okay you know i'm like it's a good challenge right so yeah going back using a phrase pack leader um honestly it's an old school term right for many this may seem like a strange thing to consider a problem but this is in fact that use of this phrase is almost always reveals a much wider common lack of understanding about the dog behavior right so of mm -hmm. course we should provide leadership to our dogs but given the recent debates with the dog training world over the misunderstanding of pack theory and dominance those who use these phrases in dog training are almost always traditional old school trainers, even if they may not know it or admit it themselves, right? Suggestion that your dog is being dominant. Ah, uh, you know, this, this something is about this word <laughs> that this term that just drives me bananas and I get so like my blood boils, right? Again, 
given how much misinformation popular media has injected into the public consciousness, this may seem like a harmless, even accurate diagnosis. Dominance is such a widely misunderstood concept. However, that is almost religiously used by punitive trainers as a catch-all root of nearly every behavior problem imaginable. Again, I'm kind of restraining myself <laughs> about this, right? Mm -hmm. The truth is quite different, however, and a misdiagnosis of dominance as your dog's problem almost inevitably leads to an incorrect prescription, one that frequently causes more harm than good. Use of shock prong, um, choke, or electric fences. If your trainer suggests use of, of these punishment-based devices, grab your dog, run away, and don't look back. And, and I'm telling you, grab your dog, run away, do not look back. It's simple. These tools have been proven by science to be less effective and cause much more damage than positive dog training tools and techniques. Combine that with the positive trainer's incentive awareness that they would rather teach dogs without the use of pain, intimidation, force-free, and the choice is clear. And they and don't fall for when people tell you they don't hurt dogs. Seriously, put it on yourself and then tell me it doesn't hurt. Um, what I also wanted to say here too is I am bound um, by because I did the CPTD, right? So it's Certified Dog Professional Association. Um, I'm bound by to use everything in order to make sure that the dogs are safe and whatnot. And, and punishment, their position is that the punishment is the very, very, very last resort. And um, you absolutely have to use everything else first, right? So anybody that jumps to punishment first, I would say no. And again, I work in, I'm a behavior analyst. So like I work with dual diagnosis and whatnot. And I would lie if I said that there's no punishment involved. There is. But again, you have to think about it. Safety. Are these individuals running away? Are these individuals going to, you know, kill themselves or anybody else, right? But you're always, always, always looking at safety for that individual and safety for everybody else, right? You don't jump to punishment right away. You never do. You never do. You need to, and again, when you do have punishment procedures, you have to teach a replacement behavior. If our viewers don't believe me, I would love for you to connect with me and I will show you everything you need to know about this, right? Um, just because I want to make sure that everybody is on the same page. I also want to talk about people that use techniques like upper rolls, kicking or poking dogs, leash jerks, or physically punishment of any dog. No. You run away. You say, no, thank you, and you run away. <laughs> um, this is not how a mother treats their puppies, okay? And you are also not a dog. So <laughs> you pretending to be their mother, you're not a dog, okay? Barking back at their dogs. Oh, my God. I have had to train dogs who went to these so-called dog trainers. It's like a chain around the, the city. They believe in barking back at their dogs. Again, you're not a mother. You're not a dog. Your barking back at dogs is just going to confuse them, okay? Um, and all these techniques, the heavy-handed techniques, have been proven to be less effective. They're more dangerous and less humane. So do not believe it when they tell you it's how their mother corrects their young. Again, me saying it again, you're not a dog. You're not their mother. It's going to confuse them. Please stop believing it's this. It doesn't happen. It's not going to happen, okay? Uh, I would rather you use timeouts. I would use um, things that are non-physical, such as, you know, avoiding, uh, removing toys, um, again, removing your attention, withholding rewards, that is much more effective. Um, I would rather have a dog that listens to me without being scared of me, okay? And then when you use all these things, you look really unstable to your dogs. They never know how you're going to react or anything, right? Um, if they have referrals, um, and references. And if these references say the same thing that I just talked about, you stay away from these trainers, right? And trainers that don't have references, I would totally not go with them. People that offer guarantees, please do not believe this. There are no 100% guarantees. Like humans, dogs are instinctive in animals, and they can never be 100% predictable. So there's always a chance that unwanted behavior may resurface, okay? Any trainer that offers a guarantee regarding dog trainer either doesn't understand dog behavior uh, or is only concerned about making money or both. 
a trainer who doesn't want to hear your dog's history. Oh my God. Like this is, this is one of my things that, that only makes assumptions. No, your dog's dominant or your dog needs to learn who's the puck leader. Run away as far as possible. I would say do your research. Listen to your vet as well, because I always check in with your vet if there's like a medical thing before also going to a trainer too, because you never know. Don't rely on letters after names either, because like even people who go to dog training schools and associations with gather professional dog trainers under various umbrellas, sometimes for the purpose of marketing them to potential clients um, more effectively, right? Like these names, right? Mm -hmm. So some of these institutions claim to collectively pro uh, profess allegiance to a particular training philosophy, while others require their memberships to adhere to various degrees of an application process. So again, a huge marketing thing, right? You need to uh, find a trainer that you feel good about. If your gut tells you something is off, listen to your gut. I don't care how many professional associations that they have behind their name. If they cannot demonstrate what they talk about, you run away from them, okay? If they do board and train without you being involved, you run away from them. If they use terms that I talked about, Please run away from them, right? There's so many dogs out there, dog trainer professionals, and they call themselves dog professionals. No, right? Please ask them, how do you, uh, how do you correct behavior? Can I speak to your past and current clients and watch their behavior, right, and body language? Do you have liability insurance? Are you a dog whisperer? How might medical issues affect my dog behavior? Because, like, think about it. It's going to correlate with, if you have a headache, how do you act around people? You know, are you more snappy? Do you want to go take a nap? Like, do you need medication to deal with that headache, right? Um, are things going to just get on your nerves more quickly, right? Uh, how are you with noises around you? If your dog has stomach issues and diarrhea or whatever, right, any kind of sort of an issue, your dog will be prone to more snapping, right? So this is what I'm trying to tell you, like, ask these questions. Do you use rewards in training? And if so, what kind, right? Bottom line is, finding a dog trainer can be a long process. But you know what? You need it. You need a good trainer to help you with your dog. So I would love, 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 love to hear from our dog, like from our viewers. Please type in dog training professionals or like dog training gone wrong or, you know, your experience with dog trainers. I would love to know. I mean, I, I feel like I talked about like this for like half an hour now. <laughs> so much to unpack, though, that like what I would say to everybody is there's going to be all this included in the notes post show. So you want to be going to the back show dot dog. But the key messages there, like, like. I love that you are not a dog. Like, stop telling like that these this equipment is replacing the mother, and then they're telling you to be the mother of the dog, barking at the dog. Like, there are so many warning signs. If there's nothing more that you take away from today, is exactly you are not a dog. You are not the dog's mother. You like yes, we are all mothers to the dogs, but you're not a dog. Could I? Could I just ask a question? Like, have you ever seen a dog kick another dog to correct? Like what? What was physical kicking from us? Like how? How? Do you, like I don't understand this. Or, or, yeah. I, just, I just don't. Or like you as a human biting a dog to stop aggression because a mother snaps or like bites or whatever. Correct it that way. You're not a dog. You're just not a dog. Yeah. And don't be taken on warranted advice at the dog park because because there is so much information out there. And if somebody listens to the wrong person, oh my god, it just seems like that information gets around so fast. So always just make sure that you run through what to look for and what not to look for what not to look for is more important and don't take advice from anybody at the dog park there is always a little helpful tips that somebody will tell you but if somebody's telling you to roll your dog on the side or to kick your dog or to to grab their their snout or like it, it's endless what what um what people will tell you so what susanna has gone through there which was a lot we will put it on the website so go to the bark show dot <laughs> We will put it on Facebook. We'll put it on Instagram as a link to refer to because it is a lot because it is a huge decision that you're making. You're putting your dog through what somebody else is going to tell you to do. So you just have to be so sure 
and it's not a quick process of making the phone call and say okay let's start you want to know everything that Susanna has gone through you want to know everything about the person because there is like you watching this right now you could start calling yourself a dog trainer start training dogs tomorrow like anybody can call themselves a dog trainer it doesn't matter like there is no requirements to call yourself anything like anybody can just say oh well I might have walked reactive dogs well I'm a reactive dog trainer and I can solve your dog's issues any any messaging like that run for the hills like like Susanna has given you so many messages there for the hills and they're so much time run 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 seriously because run to those mistakes like because they're going to impact your dog for a long time then you have to try and undo the badness so you've got the problem now it's after getting worse or other issues are after coming out of the bad training and then yep. then you end up going to find somebody like Susanna because you've learned everything that's so bad and it's gotten even worse that like you don't want to have to educate yourself from bad experiences and say, yeah. okay, well, now I know what I need to find because, like, this person ruined my dog. Yeah. It's Absolutely. crazy. <laughs> we have come to the end of our show. It was a long one. Always is with us, like, <laughs> slightly longer than normal, but so much information. So, again, all the details will be on the website, so the barkshow.dog. And I just want to thank everyone for watching today, all those who listened in on the podcast. Um, a huge thank you to Mark from Canna K9 for joining us today. That oh, was yes. super, like, like I can't even describe like how that's just going to help so many dogs. So it was super awesome to have him on. And um, a big shout out to Liam who is producing everything behind the scenes today. Awesome job as usual. And a huge thank you again to my lovely co-host Susanna. We could not do this without each other. Like it just works so well, and we can just talk way too much. That I don't know, guys. Maybe we'll need a whole day sometime to just have a slumber party. party. <laughs> I'm throwing so guys, it out there. I'm interrupting you. <laughs> yeah. So, guys, if you have anything you want us to discuss, like drop us a note. So, if you see something in the news, anything that's coming up in your area, yes, we are based in Toronto and we will talk a lot about Toronto news, but we will talk about all stuff that's going on around the world. So, let us know so you can go to the barkshow.dog just fill in the form there and let us know what you would like us to talk about if you would like to also be on the show if you have great stories about success with your dog training if you've had a reactive dog anything we just always want to hear success stories and like again who doesn't like to talk about their dog so if you would like to come on the show again go online uh, to the barkshow.dog and fill it out you can also find us on instagram at i speak dog and at Toronto Dog Walking. And again, you can just contact us through there if you don't go to the website. So we're always there. Susanna has lots of information on her Instagram page as well. So educate yourself when it comes to the comes to dog training. There's so much there. There will be lots of resources left on the website of everything that we've talked through today. So guys, until next week, it was great seeing you all today and talking to you guys. So we will see you next week. Bye. Bye.